you know, what the hell are we doing going over there? It's, it's kind of a bunch of different ways, and there's going to be sort of variances on each of it. But kind of the points of this communication, like I said, but, um, getting this this idea of looking at um, terrain in a different way. So do you think you're doing that even from this morning? That's great, perfect. And that's it's kind of what you want to be doing in the backcountry. Like when in the backcountry, the guides are pretty antisocial people. They'll never look you in the eye. Like they'll always be kind of talking to you, but they're going to be looking up at the mountains or they're going to be looking at you, that your, uh, your harness is done up properly, kind of scanning all the time. And you know, it's, just, it's, it's a habit you want to sort of get into yourself. And we'll we'll sort of carry that on tomorrow if we get some capabilities, just always looking around because there's always something to look at out there. I'm not sure. Right. Um, so, again, yeah, if people find this hard to see, we can always drop those blinds a little bit. So, I guess the other thing to mention is um, often when you've got a photograph like this, it's kind of easy, isn't it, to <coughs> sit around and discuss which way you can go. Out of the field, you're like, or out in the mountains, you're like, well, we could go up to that boulder and then over to the tree, but there's like 300 trees on the slope, and people are not too sure what you're talking about. So, this actually makes planning way, way easier. So, can we hire a helicopter each trip? Or the week before, I guess. <laughs> Saying that, um, you know, where we're going tomorrow, if we've got uh, visibility, you are you're keen on going back, maybe, maybe even up to the other side, take your camera with you. Like, ideally, if you're out in the back country a lot, you're just taking loads and loads of photographs, building up the library. So, you know, next week when you go to the peak on the other side is called Observation Peak, so next week, next month, next year, you can sort of say, oh, well, I'd like to go back there. So you can get, the, you know, get up on your screen, get a map out, kind of figure out what's what and the terrain and things. So, you know, cameras are, are great. And even, you know, I'll even use it if I'm, say, I'm heading down a, a hillside and I'm going to go up another one, um, or I'm going to be heading into some terrain up there. I'll take a photograph of it, because as I get close to it, you know, my view of it's going to change maybe on the trees. And then I can get, like, actually get the camera out and go, okay, I'll yeah, just figure it out. I've, I've done this for ski descent, so can you go up one way? I want to make sure I get into the right place on the way down, so I took a picture of it. And when, I, when I got there, I can figure out, well, what tree is here, so I just need to go there. So it's a great, great piece of technology to use. Anyway, back to the picture. So I guess the safest route, and again, this is just, just going on what people have done before and my, my viewpoint is up in here. Is this, uh, is this avalanche terrain? No. Well, I can't tell. I don't think so. Don't know it's on the there's, left. No, there's no trees here though. Yeah, it's yeah. You don't know it's on the left. No. So uh, I'd say no, it's not avalanche terrain. This is a, this is a forestry cut. So these are this is forestry roads up in here. So trees have been taken out of here. So it's, this is an avalanche slide path, but this, this isn't. This is why they, when they fell trees, they don't actually take trees all the way up to the, so up to the tree line, because otherwise they've just created a new slide path on a super slope. <coughs> Which is one of the implications of that big fire uh, in the Kootenays years ago. Um, suddenly all the trees are dead, and uh, there was a concern that a lot more slide paths were going to mm -hmm. be extended because you know, the trees have been damaged. Anyhow, uh, so up in here and then. Can you actually get through those trees? Uh, yeah, I think you could walk up through it. You wouldn't be, it wouldn't be much fun coming back down. If, especially if you're skiing. If you're, if you're snowshoeing, then yeah, but skiing or riding, it's going to be a bit of a nightmare, actually. Uh, and then from here, oops, might come up this way. Uh, I know some people had one here and then up the side of this. So, very more adventurous. There's a, some areas you'd be sort of concerned about, some start zone areas like all this, maybe, maybe into here a bit. And then some little micro features. Like there's a bit of a train trap here, some of these, whether this thing's steep enough. What was the question later? Um, 
And then, just to throw it in there, I'm not sure if anyone did this, but I have seen this as well. And then people got to here, and then they actually descended across here. And then, to me, I'll probably say least risk route, just up a step up from that, and then below they're minimizing the crossing here, they are much closer to the start zone. What about halfway down is a ridge there? We crossed there. And then went back <coughs> off and met up with the other route. We so went, we went up that street line, crossed and then met up with that one. And then okay. went up. Good work. Um, again, it's, it's maybe a little bit more You've efficient got no time, time, but you are, you are moving higher up the slow path. So fast pace. An avalanche. <laughs> <laughs> Super sonic. <laughs> so, yeah. I think just being aware that you are you're further up the track there. But not as close as that hard point. No. no. And the time people use this one is they said they'd, they'd get here and then they'd actually walk down or slide down. Okay. So rather than doing an ascending line or something, if you go across or down, so it's going to be. A little bit quicker. Um, to me, from a touring perspective, it doesn't look like a place I'd go because you know the skiing or riding might be good up here, but then you have a lot of you know, bushes to bash through uh, back down here. So this is taken from a heli ski run, heli ski area, and you know they get dropped off here, picked up there, flown somewhere else, and then back to the back to the lodge for the fun to the mass lodge. <laughs> As far as like a ski touring, that doesn't really jump out to me as a great place to go because I don't have rain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. like it doesn't, it doesn't really entice me that much. It seems like a lot of that's a short run, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So how would you get down from top to bottom? Straight down to the gully. The lake hell. I'd probably somewhere here, and then maybe down the side of this, and then in here, yeah. this yeah. way. You know, like coming down it, you might be able to mm -hmm. get down here pretty fast. Remember, coming down, hopefully that's faster than going up. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, not always. But like, then you're minimizing the amount of time in the, under the gun, if you like. But, yeah, it looks like quite a lot of work to get some turns up here to, to deal with that. I'm sure there'd be other places that would be good to go to. I like this one. Um, now, I know sometimes the comment I get back with this one is some people think that this mountain is connected to this ridge. Oh, yeah. Actually, it's not. You know, there's, a, there's a valley between it. And I think this just highlights the thing that you know, this, this is clearer to see on the, uh, on the photograph here. Um, it's a little bit hard on the picture we gave it. But um, you, know, you might be dealing with that maybe. A, not very good photograph out of a book, or not very good visibility um, if you're out in, the, out in the field. So, if you didn't use that route, then I understand why. But uh, again, going through these, then maybe down this way, probably a bit of a concern in here because there looks like damaged trees. I don't know where, the, where that's come from, so whether there's an issue from something from the left. But, uh, Probably move through there pretty quick. And then routes up here would be the ridge. Oh, yeah. um, we may have had something here. Or we'll see something like this as well. Uh, start zone, obviously, obviously one in here. Yeah. These avalanches are going to flush this way and uh, this way, and then kind of start some um, like micro, more micro features in here and yeah. here perhaps. Yeah. yeah, so where you are today really, stays on the ridges is usually safer than the spines and ridges in places, you know. Yeah. And the high ridges and the high ridges and the high ridges and the high ridges and the so just going back to this one, you know, I really I like this uh, example because on the way up here, 
you can, you know, if there's a little cornice in here, you can try to knock off. You get up to these little slopes, you can do some hasty pits in there. Maybe there's a bit of cornice you can knock down just up in here. Maybe up in this one. I could probably stop and do a pit somewhere up in here. And then up to the top. And again, by the time I've gathered all that information, I'm either going to come back roughly the same way, or maybe it's like, no, the snow is good, and uh, we, could, we could do something down here, which looks at, from a skiing or snowboarding background, but it's quite a nice, nice line. Um, it's kind of direct, nice fall line, but uh, again, it's steep, and you'd have to be sure of the snow conditions in there. But you've got options like plan A would be come down the same way, plan B might be, might be something like that. Where is this? I'm not sure where this photograph is actually. Yeah, it's, not, it's not one of mine. But, um, be a nice, nice train, though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It looks like a groom breed in the bottom of water. Yeah, yeah. it's very yeah. sinking. Yeah. 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 Any other questions or additions to that? Everyone have the kind of ones I've traced out there? Yeah. So this is where the area we're going to tomorrow. Um, just before we get started with that, just a little bit of background. If people haven't been there, I've, I've got a map later on. If people are still aren't sure after that, I've got an even more detailed map. But uh, basically this is Highway 93 going up to Jasper. Um, so you're going to go past Lake Louise, follow the Jasper turn. And then just before you get up here, on your left is going to be uh, Bow Lake. There's a couple of lakes on the way, but Bow Lake is right by the road. And on the far side of Bow Lake is a really cool log uh, hotel called Nunty Jar Lodge. And at the, the turning the road there, there's a bunch of uh, like three or four flag poles. Then you go probably another five, seven minutes up the road. Then you're going to come up to the, the crest of the, of the road here. So if you start going downhill, you're not too far. Um, it's worth slowing down as you get here. This turn's quite sharp and it's a little bit blind, but there is a sign on the side of the road saying things both summit pay to look out. And then uh, it's, unless it snows, um, which is not really forecast to, uh, this is easy. You just drive up in here. There's a parking lot just uh, just in here with some bathrooms and, and things. So that's where we're gonna meet uh, tomorrow. Okay? Uh, nine o'clock. Oh, this is a sign. Did you say it's a, is it the Pato Lake term? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is that it's up to the Pato Lake parking lot too? No, well, or is it yeah, it is actually. Because it's the number one for buses and the lower one? Yeah. It's yeah. a lower one. Yeah. 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 yeah, so the buses go up to the end, which is good. Um, I guess while we're chatting about it now, when we're parking tomorrow, folks, if we can keep the parking pretty tight, it's going to be a lot of cars up there. Um, so if we can when we park and just think about it, it's going to be a lot of people. Even if we're first? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if we're first, we're going to keep it tight. <laughs> if we're first, we're just going to park all the cars here and block the park. Turn your, your truck sideways. Right. So we park in that first lot then? Because aren't there several lots up there? The just bus one's the top one. This is the only one you can yeah. park in. Yeah. This road's it's got barricades and it's... Oh, it's very old time. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I was up there the other day and it's, it's all good. Okay. Uh, so. No, it's about two hours from here. Three. three. No. three. Almost three, three? Yeah. Um, so the ground, yeah. <laughs> Six o'clock start at, at the latest. Just right up your alley. That's the way to go. That's the way to go. That's the way to go. That's the way to just while we're chatting about it, like this is not it's not a regular choice for me to go from Calgary. So I realise there's a lot of driving. Like I live in Calgary, so I'm uh, in the same boat as, uh, as you folks. But uh, normally we go to K country, but we just don't have enough snow. And even here, you know, we don't I have think there's some pretty big snow piles outside Shaw Lakes Arena right now. <laughs> 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 and then we go to the pub. <laughs> That's a terrain travel. <laughs> you guys are in my group. <laughs> anyway, uh, so options here. You might uh, go follow. There's a road that goes up and then to here. 
Uh, you can cut the corner. Some over here. This open area in here is not this bit particularly bit. It's not because it's had avalanches. It's just kind of it's been a fire up there, but um, it's also kind of geographically it's where the trees struggle to grow a bit. However, saying that, this is an avalanche run out, and it's, uh, it's from this this bowl in here. There's another steep slope in here. That's the one that the, the group remotely triggered a while ago. And then all of this is uh, problematical for sure. So all these things, you know, this thing's coming down to here. This one's, it actually comes into here, but it doesn't over, overrun this, this feature. So why there's trees up there, there's a point of the gully on the other side, which you wouldn't really know about unless you look at the map, and even then it might not be that clear. But this is uh, it's definitely a crux going from, from this flag to this flag. Mm -hmm. And I've actually not, there's several times I've not gone across here because I've been worried about this. But also, it's pretty popular. You, get, you often get people hiking up the ridge and then riding this. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't, the times I've thought about going across there, I wasn't concerned about natural triggers, but there's a lot of human triggers up there. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. see if there's anyone up there before you think. Yeah, about. and sometimes. You can't tell as well. So how do you get to the, between the top two flags? Uh, the way I've done it is you could you could go across this way, bearing in mind that you're you're actually in avalanche terrain for until about here. But are you on the ridge there? Because it looks like you're on the ridge and therefore it would fall with that avalanche would turn It looks like there's a gully on the back side. There's a ridge here, but this isn't Yeah, there's a gully in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you're right on you're right in the middle of this okay. yeah. slope up. The safest way would probably be come down and then round. Could you go across and down a yeah. bit and then down from here? Yeah, go across. No, across here. Across. Across. No, right across the top. Of this Where you way. were before, go across. Way, go across. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah. across yeah. and then down. And follow that line. The tree line. Down. The tree line. Yeah. The tree yeah. line. No, the tree yeah. line. Over to your left. Yeah, that one. Yeah. No, over a bit more. Over a bit more. And then over a bit more than the round. Yeah. Still got to go to the gully. Yeah. The problem though, this is this is the, like the risk zone. Right. Yeah. yeah. From the picture, it's hard to tell because we had the same thought they did. It looked like there was a bit of a gully there, yeah. so the avalanche yeah. would run kind of down the other way. Yeah. And that's you know, I think that goes back to the point. You won't always. Yeah. Like, you're looking at a photograph and you're looking like. Having a map and tying that in with the map and then looking at the shape. And being there regrouping and talking to the group. Yeah. <laughs> like at the moment you could only come up with a plan A. Yeah. And when you get there it's like, well this yeah. is this is not what we thought. So yeah. perhaps like we're not we're not gonna ever make this first round. Yeah. Um, <laughs> usually the parking lot. That's it. <laughs> um I'll often go up here and then to here. So probably distance there is probably half a kilometre. Can we ski down? Uh, you can glide down. It's, it's not great to see. Um, yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll talk about gear wise. Like I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't go out and rent gear. Like this touring gear. Snowshoes are perfect for tomorrow. And, and boards aren't gonna. They're not really gonna work. <laughs> So what is a bull lake? It's not on the right. On the right side. It's on the left. Because to get to the summit you have to cross the lake. That's how we got to the bull summit. Sorry? Both summit is the summit and pass. Not cross the lake, but cross the creek that comes out of the lake. Just at the edge of the lake. That's how we got it. Alright, so uh, anyone find us the hardest one? Yeah. 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 Oh, no, we, just, we took the helicopter a few times. <laughs> yeah. so, I think this is a classic one, you know, like this simple, there's an area of simple terrain mixed up by some challenging. So, start zones up here would be this, 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 and probably this area in here. So, you know, as long as you're not going too close to that, that's all pretty straightforward. And then that's why people have been heli skiing up here, like, and see the tracks. So they've got picked up. 
and they wouldn't have had to deal with this. This, I think, is really difficult terrain to negotiate. Like, you know, it's not actually a super sort of straightforward route through there. Um, in some ways, it's going to depend again on you know, what you're using. So, if you were snowshoeing or even mountaineering and you're you know on foot, then following this moraine ridge up here will probably work. And but if you also come back. Yeah. Well, you can go back that way. That's as far as we went. <laughs> Take a photograph. <laughs> um, but if you're a, on split board or, or skis, that's not going to work. Unless, you, unless you're walking. Because uh, you need you know, snow on your feet. Um, so, for those folks, they may, some people choose a route up in here. Maybe a bit of a question mark about this, this section. <laughs> To there. And then, I don't know, like some of the, what would you just describe some of the features in here that we've talked about? Trap. Traps. Terrain traps. Yeah. What's, uh, Cornice, what's there's some cornices in there. Yeah, so there's cornices on these, on these moraine walls and they've been created by wind, wind, right there. Yeah. Right. yeah, so classic sort of cross loading yeah. features. So, you're probably guessing that all these things are going to be yeah. have more loading on them. So really, like it's pretty tough finding a, a reasonable route for that. You might be able to sneak around, you know, somewhere here, perhaps. But I think it's rock climbing. <laughs> yeah. Like, what, why would you want to? I mean, unless it's like, I mean, if you're carrying your skis, you guys get dropped off and picked up, right? Uh, I don't. But well, whoever skied up there? Yeah. Yeah. They, they didn't walk. No, they were in helicopter up there and picked up again. Well, that would be my first choice. I like them. Where are they coming from? But then uh, up in here, it's pretty straightforward. Right up to the, the top of it. Is there not a start zone just above you when you started that last line? Uh, this one? Uh, no, uh, further this down. One? Just above where you started that line. This one? So just above there. Uh, that sort of section there? No, or is it not really. as steep as it looks? No, it's not too steep. There's like little features in here which could be an issue, but yeah, this is it's not too steep. Okay. And remember, folks, when you're looking front on to something, it's actually really hard to tell the angle. And quite often, things look a lot steeper mm -hmm. when you're looking you know, front onto it. So, probably this photograph is probably a little bit easier than the, you know, the pictures I gave you. So, that track that they skied from the top down just on that slope, what, what angle do you figure that may, might be? This one here? Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, probably 20 degrees. That's not that's far. This is steeper in here, for yeah. sure. But, you know, I'm guessing they've probably done all this, and then as they get more and more confidence with the, the snowpack, they'll, yeah. they'll start to meet into this sort of steeper stuff. I don't know how they, whether they did this from here, or oh, whether they traversed yeah. it. Yeah. 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 It's tracks in here as well. So they would be building up, you know, like, getting more confidence with the, with the snow rather than going to the steepest place first one. How do you get down the bottom half on skis? Tough. Yeah, uh, like, you know, maybe sort of like slowly going down through some of this stuff, staying on, on the top, but it's really rocky. <laughs> like, I guess, again, if you came up with a, you know, if the snow was stable, you could probably just do one at a time, you know, down through here, or, or maybe work some of these things. But, Looks, it would take a lot of managing, you'd have to be pretty careful about how you, how you did it. Sure. Yeah, maybe some hidden slabs, uh, rock slabs, oh, yeah. and yeah. not in trouble. <laughs> and that's why they're skiing, you know, up high there, not you know, see tracks going down the road. <coughs> for us mere mortals, we have to walk up and down, and uh, you know, means you've got some more, some more choices to make. So I guess with Google Maps now, because you can actually see the train rather than it being just like a, a, a gem track map. I mean, it's a lot easier to sort of plan your route. Even yeah. if it's the wrong part of time of the season, you can sort of see okay. if it's somewhere that isn't normally done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I, I use Google Earth a huge amount. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing, actually. Because you can change direction and, yeah. and zoom around, you can kind of get a different mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah. Like, Unfortunately, not everywhere is the resolution is not that good. Right. Or just passing very good. There's obscure places like mm -hmm. yeah. Fairy Meadows area. It's amazing. Wow. Um, 
gold ground kicking horse stairs. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess if they if, like if they're current, you can also you can get an idea for what the snowpack, what it looks like, up, how much snow you think there is up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of it's done in summer actually. Yeah. So, but it's just yeah. at the end of the day, you know, when you look at terrain, you can go to I sort of tend to think you can go to a place in the summer yeah. and you can say that's avalanche terrain, that's avalanche yeah. like that doesn't matter yeah. whether it's summer or winter, yeah. they see that avalanche terrain is not. They just add the snow to it but it, 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 uh, it produces a, an issue. Yeah. But yeah, Google Earth is amazing actually. Good. Uh, questions? Was that a useful exercise? Yeah. 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 So I encourage no, that's kind of what we want to keep doing. Um, maybe in a little while I'll bring a bit of paper towel. I might just ask you folks just to wipe off your, your etchings then. Kind of easier than having to do something tonight. Um, and what we're going to do now is we're just going to go outside for five minutes. And wake you up. One's out to the further west of us. And then um, a little bit of stuff on snowpack. So it's a little bit dry, but I'll come. As you can. Um, just kind of looking at the cross section out to the west coast, so the coast, the Cascades, the Columbia Range, and then the, uh, the Rockies. So Calgary is going to be here, Canmore, uh, Golden, uh, Ribblestoke, and then of course the Blackburn. You can kind of think about this stretched up the uh, up north and south of the west Sorry? You've got the Vancouver Island I did, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, prevailing weather comes from west. the west, yeah. pretty similar to your thing. So, it's coming in off the, uh, off the ocean there, and uh, an effect of the mountains there is it hits the mountains, it gets lifted, um, and then as it's cool, precipitates, so rain in the summer, and hopefully snow in the winter, so anywhere you know, close to the source there is going to get a lot of precip. And then as it moves over the next range, it's going to do the same again. But each time it does that, it's kind of taking more and more moisture out of the system. And the Columbia still get a lot of snow, um, but it's less and less. And by the time it gets to the Rockies... So really this effect is called, called the rain shadow effect, even though we're talking about snow here. So the further we are from the source, the more mountain ranges, um, the drier it becomes, which you know, kind of explains why we don't get the same sort of amounts of snow as, uh, as the coast. So that's kind of prevailing. Uh, obviously you can get mixtures of that, so from the south, from the north. And then I guess for the one that uh, can affect this area is upslope storms, so from the east. And those are, it's just kind of the opposite effect, so those ones are really good for the front range. So mm -hmm. the ski areas like uh, Nikiska, Fortress when it was open, really benefited from it, um, touring in, in K country. This is pretty good after, or can be good after a, uh, an upslope. So it's going to get a lot here, but they're not very strong affairs. They're not like these ones, and you know, quite a, a lot of the time, by the time they've crossed the divide, they've put it out. You know. And you can even get, you know, it can be snowing in the front range, and then a bit of snow in Canmore. By the time you get to Banff, and then Lake Louise, it's, it's sunny. So it doesn't, doesn't have that sort of same uh, strength effect there. Um, so if we, just because I put 10 on here doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that's what it is, but uh, if we were thinking about snow depths for coastal range, people have got experience about or read about it or whatever, what sort of depths of, of snow are we looking at, settled snow? Olympic like year or non olympic year? I'll say non olympic year. Yeah. Yeah. Guess six, six, five, four, six, six, five, uh, like down in California, which is, again is a there's a coastal range, 15, 20 meters, and California sometimes. But let's say, I don't know, let's say seven or eight meters. Then. Whatever it is, it's way more than we get here. Um, and again, mainly because of that, uh, that effect. And then, how would you describe the, the consistency of the snow? Because... Yeah, it's like temperature. Picking all off the Pacific down. It's also relatively mild. As well, so uh, warm, wet. Any other descriptions for the snow? Heavy. Heavy. 
and then dense sometimes people just yeah. square it. Yeah. So that's kind of that. Um, let's obviously as we go through here, we're kind of looking at sort of less in Rockies. How about uh, depth? Three. Three would be a good year. Like, two meters would be good. Like, last year was good. Right now, 50 centimeters, 70 centimeters, something like that. So, let's say it was a good year in a couple of meters. And then, how would we, some of the descriptors for that? Sorry? Light. 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 So, it's pretty much all the all the things opposite uh, to that. Yeah. How about um, air temperatures? Again, just roughly for the coast, say up at the tree line or the other line. So like higher up the mountains. You might get minus five if you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> and then to above freezing. Yeah. So rain, yeah. rain up there. So maybe, so, I don't know, minus five degrees to Plus five or plus two or something. Just just rough things, it's just to give it kind of give us an idea of depth of snow and the yeah. air temperatures we're dealing with. Rockies? Plus thirty right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Minus five to minus twelve. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty like especially higher up Very higher up in the tree line. It's not <laughs> like we had a rain event in November. So that'll be the last time we'll get a warming. Happening up there, so maybe zero at the warmest, but probably a little bit less than that. Down to minus 15. Yeah, minus 30. Yeah, like extremes, minus 30, but yeah. maybe minus 20. Yeah. yeah, we can argue about exactly what it is, but just to give us an idea that coast, coastal sort of maritime snowpack, um, something deeper and relatively warm and warm on temperatures above. Uh, a continental snowpack, a long way away from uh, like the effect of the, uh, water sources or ocean, um, less snow, and then colder, colder air. And we're going to come back to that in a little while once we've chatted about snowpack structure, because you know what we find here is going to dictate what happens actually within within the snow and why the Rockies actually have a very different snowpack to the, uh, the coast. Uh, so they would rarely ever see powder on the coast. Oh, they might do, not, but not as much as frequent as that's all we really get. It's further inland as well. Like you know, these mountains get really good yeah. conditions, but they'll probably be kind of incremental. How do you explain uh, somewhere like you know around Field in Yoho, like where they get so much snow there? I mean, it's like you look at it's like 15 feet deep when you're walking around Emerald Lake. So lakes, maybe no, because even yeah, Kanaski's lakes just area that one gets. Lake, though, no. But it's the wet uh, side. I mean, or Fernie. I mean, where they get so much snow there? Yeah, that, that'll be a bit different because it's uh, the track coming in there. This, you know, it's through there. Yeah, it's kind of mixing, mixing up. Feel of it. I've never been aware of a lot of snow there, unless it's wind, wind depositing. I'm not sure I've never seen that, yeah. that much snow in there. But maybe, maybe it's wind effect, like drifts and things yeah. like that. Sorry, the temperatures we're talking about here, are these snow temperatures or ambient these temperatures? These are air temperatures. Yeah. Or, the or like, like <laughs> the, the, the top of the Rogers Pass on the roof of that motel. Or hotel. I mean, sometimes it looks like it's 20 feet high. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Revelstoke, they actually, yeah. they talk about um, 60 feet of snow. Yeah. Now, that's not settled snow. Yeah. That's what we're looking yeah. at here. It's yeah. like one storm after another. But uh, and this could be this could be way more than this. It could be like 50 meters or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like 12 years might be sort of 12, 3, 4 meters. Yeah. I find this really interesting because I think you know, where's the best place to move this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so some of the down where Craig lives as well is pretty. I've never been there, but it uh, sounds pretty good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. yeah. Up to four meters of solid snow. Wow. We haven't for a while. But... <laughs> <laughs> Are there any mountains that have their own weather in, in the Rockies? Sorry? Their own weather. Some mountains like Asinibo. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, you always look at it, it's always in the clouds. Yeah, Matt Robson is the same yeah. as well. Yeah, so there'll be different effects within that. But even if, even in Europe, it's kind of a sort of similar concept. And where I was in, in Scotland, then, you know, we didn't have, it wasn't, geographically, it wasn't that uh, big a distance, but the West Coast, so like Fort William, Ben Nevis, was way wetter and um, more snow than where I was further to the east. So this, this effect here is you know, relevant to where are you. Okay. Well, we're going to come back to this uh, in a little while, but for right now, um, kind of get into a little bit of the snow science side of it, and then just to kind of front load this about how much we're going to talk about. This. I've kind of already said, you know, it's not going to take too long. Um, in the back of the the book here, so page. 66 to 68 is some uh, text and photographs on some different uh, formations of, uh, of snow crystals. <coughs> when, this is three pages in this book that's like sort of 70 or 80 pages long about snow science, and I totally agree with this. Like, yeah. I think this is all. This is this is what you need. To, this is about as much as you need to know right now. Like, it's not to say you know you shouldn't be interested in that, but I definitely wouldn't got, get too bogged down in the science. You're better off making sure that you understand the rest of the, the text in this book than you know, start getting too heavy into the snow science of it. Now if you, if you go on to do other courses, particularly the CA level 1s and 2s courses, then you will need to know more. And kind of, this is kind of probably the, the work you'd need to get for that, but this has got tons of real geeky stuff about snow crystals and science and I wouldn't you know I wouldn't advise rushing out to get this. You know, learn the practical stuff first and then this is kind of nice to know rather than than you need to know. So you know after this session if you kind of have got the concepts about this and some of the, the terminology then that's that's probably a great a great start. Does that make sense? Alright. Um, so those three pages, so some of that is uh, it's all about metamorphism, and that's just the way um, think snow changes uh, once it's landed on the uh, on the ground. So outside, we talked about what happens with weather conditions and wind, and how it creates slabs and, and so on. Now we're going to kind of look at some of the things, some of the other ways crystals develop. Um, one of them there doesn't actually go into the description of it, but there was a photograph of it. It's uh, surface wall. We see on page uh, 68 there. It's got some uh, some photographs of surface hall just there. And I'm sure everyone's seen this. May may not be totally aware of what it was at the time. So it's like a diamond field when you walk through it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, when we're out tomorrow, they're already like last weekend. They were developing quite well. So they'll actually be even bigger now because it hasn't really. Done too much since then. So, uh, what we have is the snow surface, um, and then perfect conditions for surface hall to develop is kind of what we've got now. So, um, clear nights, cold weather, um, and ideally not very windy conditions. So, just a light wind is, is great. And what's happening there is uh, vapor is uh, moving from the atmosphere, it's condensing onto the snow surface. So, these crystals are actually starting here and then growing this way, and so if you like, they'll, they'll be like this, and they take several days or, you know, and the longer that period goes, that cycle goes on, the bigger these snow crystals get. And they'll grow wherever, you know, conditions are, are right for them, so like I said, calm, out of the sun, especially. They can get damaged very easily by wind and or sunshine, but uh, where it's protected from that, they'll, they'll fly, and particularly around water sources, so in creek beds and things, because there's a, there's a small humid around there. So, looking at that photograph, is that, so people seeing those sort of crystals out? Uh, on the surface, like you said, sort of diamond field, it's not a problem. You know, like they're actually quite nice to ski around on, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. The issue we've got though, because the longer this goes on, the more surface will get developing. This is a, a weak layer that's going um, to end up being a problem in the snowpack. 
So while it's lying on the surface, not an issue, what do we have to add to this to be a problem going back to our more snow? Okay. So more snow and particularly, what would the consistency of this snow will be worse? When? Dense. Heavy? Or just a slab. Yep. So if there was some um, cohesiveness to the snow. Because if it was just light and fluffy, then we don't have our three ingredients. But if this turns into a slab or it's put down as a slab, and we got slab, we've got a weak layer, we've got a bed surface. Yeah. And these probably out of all the snow crystals, these are probably responsible for um, the most of the accidents or avalanche incidents. Is it true they take a if they do actually ever like settle, that it takes a long time? Can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And the idea with this is like, you know, if only had a bit of snow on it, yeah. well, versus a couple of meters, mm -hmm. then they would actually squish out pretty pretty quick. But if they've got a little bit, because these are actually they're quite resistant to change in compression, but if you put them on an angle, then they're quite weak in the shear. So they'll support a reasonable amount, of, you know, a certain, a certain amount of weight like that. But when they go, it's kind of like this house of cards where they you know, the failure will actually be quite. Uh, Quite fun, like really fast. But they're probably more like actual ice than snow, which is more just the tiny little fluff particles. More yeah, ice. yeah. And we'll we'll try and point some out tomorrow. Like this, like in that photograph there. That's kind of that's, that's really nice. that's just what we look like now. So, like I mentioned, they're very persistent um, to change. And last year we had. In the snowpack, you could actually just cut a, cut a line through and you could see three different um, surface oil events. So we had uh, nice clear weather, surface oil formed, it got buried. Nice clear weather, another layer. So we had three, at some point, one point, we had three layers, and all of them we were getting reactions on, but one was worse, uh, worse than the other. And uh, this was still giving results six weeks, one of these layers, six weeks after it had been buried, it was still, it was still actually failing. With time, it took more more effort to get it to go, but really, really persistent in the snowpack and a big problem for sure. And they're kind of it's innocuous because they're, they're developing now in this good weather. And now what we're worried about, and, you know, if you think about hazard forecasting, is what's going to happen in the next snowfall. So, as far as making things less hazardous, what would be what would be an ideal thing to happen to this before it snowed? Warm enough to melt. Yeah, so it melts. Or wind. Or wind. Yeah. And so, like, particularly in this range, we're not going to get melting right up to the mountain tops now. That's not going to happen. We might get some sun effect. So, if you, now this is where it starts getting tricky with this one. As I say, I'm looking down on top of a mountain. Um, and that's, this is my tree line here, and this is my alpine. And let's say I've got surface floor all over the mountain. And let's say the sun comes out and it manages to get rid of some of the surface ore up in the alpine, you know, strong enough to do that. But down in the trees, some of the surface ore is, uh, is sheltered because of the, the trees. But let's say the wind picks up and it's really strong through here, so maybe it does affect some of the stuff in the trees and maybe it gets rid of the rest of the stuff in the alpine. But these sides, it wasn't in the sun, um, wasn't affected by the wind. Now we've got these areas, like this particular zone, that could be a problem when it snows on top of it. Yeah. So you could be fine here, you might be okay down here, but there's particular areas that are just buried. Remember this morning when I was talking about the hazard rating, often it's, it's elevated and then it gets lower as you get lower down. Often when you see an up, you know, a higher hazard in the tree line or below tree line, it's probably because of buried surface oil. So last year it was actually when you got up above in, into the alpine you were fine. But there was a there was a zone and this happened like a few seasons now. It's almost like from for example from eighteen hundred meters to fifteen hundred meters on north but north and east facing slopes is really bad. Yeah. And in, in fact talking to some of the ski guides, they actually made it a no ski zone in here. And the guides would ski down with the altimeter watches on. And when they got to 1850, they'd stop, even if there was good skiing there, they get picked up and flung, flung some rice. It could be that. It grows at night? 
Uh, that's that's a good time. But then it doesn't it's, matter if it's on the on the sunny side or the shadow side of the mountain. <coughs> yeah, like night time's it's good because you've got a clear night. Yeah. So what can happen is it grows at night, and then on the south side it gets burnt away, burnt back, and then it grows again. Whereas on the north side it's just growing and growing and growing. Um, so this is super tricky uh, weakness of the snowpacks. Like it's, it's really it's really difficult to um, get your head around, and there could be like little pockets of it which are worse than others. And that's why it's, it's such an issue. So if you're reading about it or you're aware about it, then I mean, just treat it with a lot of caution. And, and the hazard rate, the hazard bulletins that talk about it, they'll describe exactly where it is. Uh, they'll tell you tell you what it is, how far down in the snowpack. So you don't have to go through all that learning stuff. But I think it's yeah, it's, it's a tough one for sure. Any comments on that, Craig? But I don't know. Is it not uh, universal all the way in a certain area? Like let's say Karnask is all the way to Lake Louise because the rain or snowing so differently, yeah. right? I mean, can even we have a uh, different sports like here? It's snowing today, but not tomorrow. Yeah, no, that's totally different. From so how do you judge then to be all all the way if you find a, a weak layer? Uh, you're gonna have to either go with what the bulletin's talking about, and then and then just being very aware. Like if you're not sure of where it is, then you know, like avoid it, avoid being on in that large terrain. If you're thinking that's. Because the research uh, being done, it's you, you mentioned that uh, it's done pretty much cover the whole area, or whatever it's yeah. on the map here, and uh, can you generalize, and then you apply. More specifically, to be more exact, or well, like what do you say? You find a weak layer this year, right? Um, elevation and aspects. So, 1850, all throughout, all the way 100 kilometer range, could be. radius could be 1850, could be a weak layer, you say. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some places, hard to grasp, for example, like in Rogers Pass, there's yeah. some areas that. Surface all grows really, really quickly. In other areas, it doesn't, and it's the same elevation, it's the same aspect. It's just a kind of an anomaly with the with the weather conditions. I don't actually know why one place is worse than another. Is it more prevalent the further in you come from the coast, or do they have the same problem on the coast with the surface all? Uh, they're probably dealing with any sort of mild conditions. They're going to get rid of that, so you kind of need a compromise. That we're further we can go. They will, well, they'll get it there for sure. Um, there's a better chance there is it's going to melt. And yeah, but it's a bit of a temperature story. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it's not really adding anything, it's not changing anything we've talked about already um, as far as you know, how we negotiate and make our decisions. It's just, you know, it's, um, it's another way that we can get weak layers forming in the snowpack. And, you know, it can be really variable even in, in one place. But you know, if you go into an area and there's, you know, they're talking about buried surface hoar and the hazard type, then I'd be really, really careful um, you know, where you go. Like, it's not to say you wouldn't go in there, but there'd be you know, lots of, sort of fine terrain choices where you would be in here to see it. But this is where you probably get a lot of woofing and cracking. It, like, in those conditions, you know, last year, I was just talking to Craig about it, that break. Um, you couldn't even get close to a slope before it had a Like, I was remote triggering stuff up to 50 or 60 meters away. And like, everything was going like slopes this big. They were just cracking in. Probably in one day, we tr probably triggered 30 different slopes. Like, one avalanche just, the effect of it just caused all these other ones to go. It's like, it was unbelievable actually. And that was, that was pretty, that's kind of unique conditions for me, you know, like being out in, but I've been doing this a while and you know, that was an eye opener for me, for sure. Wow. In some ways it was easy decision making because it's just like, well, we're not going to go into yeah. anything more than 20 degrees. Cool. Questions or? So that's, uh, that's service hall. Um, on the other side of Page 68 there, it talks about melt freeze. This is a real, really easy one, um, unfortunately. Get away from the 
technical surface for one. Um, literally, it's uh, rainfall or warming, uh, solar or, or the rising freezing level, melting the snow, uh, water running down between the snow crystals, and then uh, and then refreezing. So, you know, if the if the warming cycle is only short lived, then you might end up with a little crust <coughs> just feel on the surface. If it goes on and on, you know, and more and more water percolates down through the snowpack. You know, you can have a layer that you can walk around on, it could be the whole snowpack. So, you know, maritime snowpack, so coastal range or in Scotland, we didn't really have any power conditions and most of it was melt freeze because of this cooling cycle all the time. So it's, it's got like this like snow ice up here. So that's, uh, that's melt freeze and like I said, it produces things called crust. And then tomorrow when we have a look in the snowpack, we'll see that, that crust that uh, formed in the start of November from that rainfall then. So that's kind of low, lower down in the snow. So that's what that terminology would be. And then if we flick back page, so page 66, um, another metamorphism is, is a rounding. Um, and you can see the, the photographs there, how the snow crystals tend towards a more rounded um, shape. Now we're not talking about, this is different to melt freeze. If the crystals aren't melting, they're just changing their form to a more rounded state. So, snow crystal to be like that stellar snow crystal with the nice arms, that actually takes a lot of energy for it to remain, remain in that state. And if you get temperatures down to minus 40, minus 50, the snow crystal will stay like that indefinitely. But as we bring temperatures up, again, we're not melting it, but if we bring them up to minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, those sort of regions, then this process is accelerated. Is that like corn snow? Uh, it would be if you went through that process time and again. Yeah. But yeah, corn cool, will be actually it's almost a melting and pre freezing. Yeah. So this isn't the important principle to, to realise it's not it's not melting, it's a rounding phase. Okay. How do you use this in the field though? This is talking about do you actually take a hand magnifier to look at the uh, things or? You can do. Yeah. Um, kind of my argument with this is at the end of the day. If you can't recognise the snow crystals in the snowpack, does it matter? <laughs> at this stage, I'd say no. I, again, I've been doing this for a while, and I'll look at snow, and as I've got a magnifying glass, it's like, well, I don't really know, I can't really tell what that is. But the important thing is that it actually sheared really easily, and I noticed one thing over there, and cracking here, and I saw that launch. That's kind of, that's really the important bit. I always consider this as a nice to know. But the reason we're covering this is, um, in the bulletins, there's terminology in there, which we wouldn't really be doing a, we'd be doing a disservice if we didn't sort of say what crusts is and what facets are, or what surface or so. Well, so. Yeah, it's good to have the background then. Yeah. I was just wondering you know, how far you take it in. But uh, I think part of the stage of this course, and if people are just getting into us, then if you, if you understand that, if you don't recognize the crystals out in the field, it doesn't really matter. It's more. So it's the other things that are important. That's, yeah, good point. Um, so like I said, these, these snow crystals are wanting to reduce their, their energy. And different way, different process, but you kind of sort of think about it in the same way. For me to stand at the front of the class, although first of all, looks stupid like this. It also actually takes a lot of energy to stand like this, although. So it's easier for me to do that. Or it's actually easier for me to, to do this. It's just less energy. So different, different physics behind it, but the principle is the same. That the snow crystal wants to reduce its, its surface area. So if we have all these snow crystals stacked up on top of each other, and it's you know they're going to rounding, then they're all doing this in the snowpack. So if we have a meter of snow, and they're all like that, you know if we have temperatures of minus three, minus four, the next day it might be 80 centimeters because they're all they're all doing this, and then the next day it's similar. Six or seventy and sixty-five. So we're actually getting settlement in the snowpack. So the crystals are going to a rounded phase. And as they do that, the bonds between them are improving as well. So there's kind of strength uh, occurring in the in the, the snowpack. Does that make, make sense? Yeah. So that's our that's our rounding process. And any any temperatures in that range we talked about, the the, uh, the overriding process will be the rounding settling process in the, in the snow. Okay, so we're good with that one. Okay, and then uh, on the other side, it's a little bit more complicated, so I'll try and explain it as, as simple as I can. 
Um, this other process is faceting or squaring. Other terminology would be depth pour, sugar snow, they kind of they all, all describe it. And I'll maybe just go through some of the parameters that you need for, for this to occur. So let's say we've got the ground, and uh, so we put a meter of snow on the snowpack. And just to keep the, the maths easy here, let's say that the ground is zero degrees. Now it's going to be a bit less than that, but just uh, keep the maths easy. And then uh, let's say the air temperature is minus 10 degrees centigrade. So the temperature gradient over that meter of snow is 10 degrees centigrade for the meter. Yeah. This is kind of the critical factor. Um, and what it actually does, it's almost like an engine in the snowpack, which drives vapor from the warm region towards the, the cold area in the snowpack. If it's less than that, that engine switches off. If it's greater than that, then that, uh, that movement of vapor accelerates. And so it's, it's microscopic movements of vapor between the, the snow crystals in the, uh, in the snowpack. So if we, uh, if we zoom in, and we've got a big, some big snow crystals in there, So what's happening is vapor is, uh, is moving from, from, an, from an ice form into a vapor and it's traveling upwards driven by that uh, gradient. And then as it comes into contact with an ice crystal here, it's condensing onto it. And it's doing the same in here. In here. It's also doing the same down in here. So with time, what we're actually doing is getting icy lenses forming on these crystals and they're taking on this form of faceting or, or squaring. Now this process will start straight away, but probably it's going to take a few days before you can actually physically see it. And then given several weeks of it, then you're actually starting to look at crystals that we've got in that, uh, in that photograph with lots of you know, striations. Just in there. And we'll actually be able to see these tomorrow because there's a lot of, of these in the snowpack now. What's also happening is these, at one point when, when the snow you know, settled out, the bonds between these crystals are quite good, but now as vapor is moving away from them, they're actually breaking down and they're all becoming kind of almost independent of each other. So the bonds actually deteriorating in the snowpack uh, with time. And that process will just keep going and keep going as long as that engine's driving it um, up here. So can you have days of it moving more towards rounding and other days? Yeah. Yeah. So, that's a good point, you could have the engine switching on at night and then it switches off and it might start to round and then it goes back to squaring and rounding. Yeah. And this can be accelerated if, it's, if it gets colder as well. Is it possible to have several weak layers simultaneously? Several Not only weak layers? Yeah. yeah. Is it common? Or? Yeah. So then that faceting process would lead to a weak layer. Yeah. yeah. So if we... Uh, we zoom out here, then what we're going to, you know, often we'll see is this faceting, you'll see it initially down in the snowpack in here, down in, near the warm region. But with time, the whole snowpack could be faceted out and just become rotten. And if you're familiar with the Rockies, then you might recognize that, especially when you're out hiking around or skiing, you break down through this upper layer. And then the stuff underneath, you're hitting logs and rocks and the ground. And the snow, if you pick it up in your hands, you know, it's like sugar, it just yeah. falls out your hand. And that's, that's what this is. It's not, it hasn't gone through a melting, uh, refreezing phase. It's actually um, been, the snowpack's been kind of destroyed, if you like, by these, uh, these temperature radiators. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so the looks of, could the wind help drive? Sorry? Would, would the wind contribute to that? Um, or is it strictly the temperature? It's mainly the temperature in here. There might be there might be some effect of wind blowing across the top, but not okay. not more than that. Yeah. Can that happen in all the temperature ranges, or does the bottom end of that gradient need to be close to zero? No, like uh, this could be minus two if this was minus twelve up here. But if this was minus twenty down here, then that actually inhibits the, the flow of vapor just because vapor won't move very easily in those, in those temperatures. So it's possible this year here we might have kind of the worst case of it. It was actually pretty warm and then we got all the snow and then it really cooled off. Yeah. 
Yeah, and like, if we think about uh, this year, do we have a meter of snow? No. Yeah. So uh, we've got half a meter? Yeah. Yeah. So with those parameters, what we've just done to the, the engine, yeah, I've just doubled it. What temperatures have we had this year? Minus 30. So what have we done to this engine now? Six times the sort of minimum value. So like, you know, the conditions we got now are what we've had. A little bit less now, but it's still, especially at night, it's still happening. It's perfect conditions for fasting to occur. Is this typical of the Rockies? Mm -hmm. Lately, <laughs> yeah, last year too. Yeah, and the year before, like the year before was even worse. That December where it was minus yeah. four. So last year we had lots of snow by this time. We had lots of snow. Yeah, and then, and then it didn't snow for a while. Yeah. 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 And then we started getting faster in the snowpack. And this can this can occur anywhere. Like it could be higher in the snowpack if this is relatively warm. You have a big gradient across it. So they will they call this faster? Or what do they call it? Depth both depth four? Uh, they'll often refer to it as facets. Yeah. yeah. I think in the in the bulletin it's talking about that. It has been. So this is actually this is a Rockies typical Rocky snowbanks. Nothing new. It's we'll always get this. Some years will be worse than others. Um, a bad a bad build up for this is low low amounts of snow and then cold temperatures. Um. So you say the depth is important. Let's say you've got a one meter and a, and a 10 degree disparity in temperature. If you suddenly dump another meter of snow on that, do you stop the engine? Yep, if it stays at minus 10, okay. it'll be minus 20 on the top to keep the engine going. Okay. Yeah. So what would be the, the <coughs> lowest amount of snow, the height uh, to cause an avalanche? 10 centimeters? Uh, Could be anything. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Like, you know, I've seen crown walls this, this deep, for sure. Um, the consequence may not be that bad, but it could actually be triggered quite, quite easily because of that. Yeah. So anywhere where there's enough slab, we don't see the weak layers, got potential to slide. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, we were at the Cascade Dam for fears, and there was no snow at all on the slope. And all of a sudden, there was an avalanche, and it was just enough, and it was just a trickle, actually. Yeah. You know, nothing to run from, but, yeah. you know, anything can cause an avalanche. Yeah. So, going back to this, like if the whole snowpack becomes faceted, do we have our ingredients for a slab avalanche? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, how many have we got? No, you need a whole thing right Yeah, so we got, we got bed surface, we got a weak layer, yeah. and then we need more snow to pull up. And so, you know, the issue we've got now is we've also got some surface ore on top of this. Yeah. So any any yeah. any uh, increase or any dumps of snow in slab form, then you're probably going to see the temperature, uh, the hazard spike up because you've got weaknesses in here and you've also, it's, it's going down to, to faster than there yeah. as well. So, you know, right now it's, it's you know, it's deteriorating the snowpack. It's going to depend on what happens Snaps. But like I said, this is this is typical. You know, like it's nothing, nothing new here. Some some years are worse than others. But the issue with uh, these crystals, because now they're buried in the snowpack, then there's not much that's actually going to affect them. Like it would have to rain and, and melt all the way through there to destroy it. Wind's not going to do anything. Um, other more avalanches, a big avalanche cycle can flush all this out, and then we start again. But uh, you know, facet layers you could be, you, know, you could be considering those for the rest of the season into April time. You might start rearing their, rearing their heads again there. That's why I tend to think forecasting, I mean, hazard forecasting for the Rockies is actually hard. You know, it's not an easy, easy thing. It's not easy. It's not easy for me. It's not for the forecasters and you know for rec recreationists going out in there because there's always there's always things in the snowpack. I always tend to think forecasting in Scotland or the coast, you know, things got worse and they got better, whereas here there's, all, you know, there's always instabilities in there. Um, then just one last thing to add in here, and this kind of ties back to some of the stuff we were talking about this morning, is if we uh, have a rock 
on this slope, and let's say, let's keep it easy, just say the temperature around the rock is zero. Do we have a strong gradient from here to the surface? Do we have a strong one? Yeah. Temperature gradient. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, the distance is shorter, but the temperature is the same. So these are ideal places for faceting to occur around rock features and trees and things. So all of a sudden, this kind of starts fitting in with when we talked about trigger zones and super weak zones, is you know, if we get getting this occurring, we've got a shallow snowpack, then you know, we could actually be going, if we went from rock to rock, we could be linking up the weakest points on that. And actually, in the bulletins, at some points, they'll actually talk about avoiding shallow snowpacks, like moraine walls and rocks and things, and that's exactly why, it's because you could be linking these things up. And that's kind of almost counterintuitive because it's like, well, you know, going to the deeper snowpack, surely it's going to be a deeper avalanche, but maybe it's less less faceted, and also the facets that may that much further below you, so maybe there's less chance of triggering them. And when you go back to those photographs, we had rock to rock, and quite a few of those, particularly in the, in sort of, in the pictures in the, in the Rockies there. Almost sounds like that scenario you showed us in the video when that guy was high pointing on the yeah. sled. Yeah. Yeah. And these rocks, for example, are covered with snow, you, you talked about, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, if they are uh, surfacing the snow, the heat also, like I said before, you may heat some areas near the rock, yeah. and it's a whole mess right there. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, because the rock will be warm. And then, yeah. So, uh, scary stuff. Yeah. Um, and then, just kind of going back to what we started with this. You know, like this is, we talked about rocky snowpacks, so shallow snowpacks, cold temperatures. Um, coastal, deeper snowpacks, dense, um, warmer. Now, it's not to say we don't get faceting occurring here. And not last season, the season before, we had the really cold temperatures. Then there was a couple of um, skiers killed in Whistler, like separate accidents, and that was a facet layer because they had a bit of snow, very cold temperatures, and then they had snow on top of it. Um, and then the, the, the um, school group in Rogers Pass, that was faceted. So it occurs in these different, different areas, it's not just peculiar to the Rockies. So wherever you get a bit of snow, cold temperatures, then, uh, then that's going to occur. But the general thing is we get a lot more of it just, just in here. So the perfect, perfect conditions to make a stable snowpack would the snow just keeps falling and falling. It doesn't get too cold. It just builds up and builds up. But it's not, <coughs> that's not a rocket <coughs> snowpack. But there are other worries, you know, cascades such as lightning or, or down in uh, California mountains or, or uh, Colorado. They have light, higher... Uh, Lightning per uh, year, per season. Yeah, so uh, the hazard for backcountry. Because the, sure. the warm air is causing a lot mm -hmm. of formation of lightning, yeah. uh, thunderstorms, and such. Yeah. Well, here it's not as bad. Uh, uh, in the summer, we get a lot of that. That's in the summer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go too much further into that. Does that, that make sense? So, we talked about rounding, we talked about faceting, surface hall. Um, crusts, and again, that's some of the terminology. You know, when you read the bulletin tonight, they'll definitely they'll definitely talk about faceting. That's what they were, and they might mention crust and things. So hopefully that will uh, fill in some of the blanks then. So you recommend this is the first resource? Is there any kind of follow-up ones you recommend after this? Uh, I really like uh, these these two. This one's really good. Actually. Probably. Yeah, it's a toss-up between these. I, I like this one. It's, got, it's really good education. It's got lots of good, good ideas. But this is very good as well. The other book's good, but it's it's kind of more if you're getting into the snow science of it. So that might be the last book on the yeah, might be the last book on the Christmas card list. <laughs> so what's a follow-up for this kind of courses? Like, is it this is number one and then the second one and that's it, or is it? Uh, no, that's a good question. You can answer now. Um, so there's. This one and then the AST2, which is, uh, it's actually changed a little bit. Um, it's a four-day course, um, and that's 
uh, more theory, and then lots of uh, travel in, in ambushed or in terrain. So those ones, the ones we run, are there for uh, uh, ski and snowboard touring courses. We don't, we don't actually got them set up for um, snowshoeing. But I'm sure if uh, if people, you know, we could actually run a course for that. Say a group of uh, six or eight people got together, and we could actually tell a tell one for that. But we tend to do the touring ones, um, and then the, the sledding courses. So that would be that would be the ST2. Uh, beyond that, then it's getting more into the um, professional ones with the level one, level two courses that the CA do. CA. CAA. CAA. Well, what it stands for, uh, CAA? Canadian Avalanche Association. Okay. Um, and then, really, like any course that the YAM does, any sort of winter course will, will add an element of education in there as well. Um, so, we don't just forget about snow hazard, that's actually part of the, the courses as well. And then, for you folks, it's, it's really just going to be either doing more reading, more courses, and just going out and you know, getting the experience. So kind of going through the things we've done, looking at the snow, traveling around and stuff like that. Thanks. Questions or? No? Okay, well, four o'clock. Um, final section should be, should be half an hour of this um, on rescue. So, <laughs> Not to make a light of a serious subject, but it's about the only humorous thing I've ever Go to the club, leave them there. So, kind of talked about survival rates. Um, so, this golden period is sort of 15 minutes, trying to get people out. So, the point about this is it's not calling for. Not going out to get a rescue team because by the time they get back, it's going to be too late. It's just rescued by the people on the scene at, at the time, so companion rescue. Because pretty quick, the survival rates drop off um, pretty dramatically, but then they kind of sort of plateau out into the hour, two hour. And that's often because people have probably got a, a good airway, so either they actually made it, managed to make an airway, or perhaps there was enough flow through blocks of snow that uh, they could survive. And I had a, a friend and colleague buried in this is a and then just trying to protect your uh, your airway really. So you know, while you're if you're in the slide, it's just getting your hand up to your face just to protect your mouth and nose. Particularly if the avalanche comes to a stop, you really want to have something up there. Because if the avalanche stops, you want to be able to protect that but also push it away and just you know, sort of maintain a bit of a space in front of you. I guess if your hands are up there too when you come to stop, you can try and dig it. Little space. No. Um, no, it'll be, no. It'll be like this little really? time plate. You might be able to do that. No. Yeah. Okay. Might, and then you might be able to move there, but okay. you might be able to move much more than that. It's, it's kind of shocking actually how it changes. It the, mm -hmm. the rock. Yeah. Again, you know, if you're aware of where the surface is, maybe you get a flash of sky, you, you know, you're not going to be able to get to the surface, but if you get a hand up there or a foot or whatever. And then there's probably no point shouting straight away, but if you're, if you're aware of rescuers nearby, then you can, you can start calling. Because the snow's a really good insulator of sound, um, so they're not going to be able to hear you unless you can unless you can them. So that's the point, though, right? If you practice shoveling somebody else or shoveling one of those uh, gizmos up that there's snow on you, if you're not really digging a real snow, but you'd be yeah. faced with two and a half months or something, it's hard right or wrong. Uh, yeah, it'll, it'll be a mix, kind of depends on how far it's from. So the question was, you know, when you practice shoveling, you know, if it's just in a, in a drift of snow, it's not that realistic. Um, but sometimes, yeah, this is not realistic either, but if you think about the, you know, the um, bank of snow on the side of the road where it's been ploughed, it's not going to be as hard as that, but it's going to be a mix of the, of the two. So a lot more work in the stack, Oh, yeah, 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 a huge amount of work. Yeah. Um, and if you ever, if you ever get to somewhere where there's some avalanche debris, you know, as long as it's safe to do it, yeah. you know, that's often a good place to do some practices. But you've got to be sure there's not going to be another avalanche. Yeah. 
So if you see, you know, someone shouts and you see that, I know it's super obvious, but this is actually really important. Um, why, you know, if someone disappears partway down the slope, why do we really, really want to know where we last saw them? How does that? So yeah. they might have to be able to Sorry? How does they disappear at the start? Yeah. So if I go there, I don't, it rules out the area of searching above it, and they're going to be, I'm going to sort of find them in the line down from there. So I know some guys actually talk about sort of like lasering in, like watching the person that disappeared there, maybe kind of keeping a check, can't see them again, right? That's where they, they disappeared. Yeah, they're tough though, they're moving it. Yeah, it is tough, but uh, yeah. if you yeah. get a basic area, yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you can get yeah, around, if you relate it to a tree or a line yeah. or something like that. Does it matter if you know, if, like, if you're caught in it, which, which way is up? Does it matter? You aren't going to be able to do anything about it anyway? No. Yeah. And people talk about spitting or whatever. I think it's something like that, yeah. No, uh, there's been, I know, I read about one where a guy was buried, but he was actually buried in the entrance of a mine shaft. And he actually, you know, he kind of actually dig himself out. But really, it's not, you're not going to be able to do that. You know, like, I talked to a guy and he was hit from behind. Yeah. And he was buried uh, face down. Mm. And he was like, he thought he was fully buried, couldn't move. And the group came down to me, kind of like standing looking at him, wondering why he wouldn't stand up. The whole lot back was exposed, but his head and his arms were in. And he would have, like, they didn't dig him out. He could have wow. died there, actually. And yeah, it kind of looked like he was wow. half out of his snow. So, can I go back to some of the things we talked about this morning when we looked at that uh, slab in, in France, uh, the ski area? What do we, or some of the things before you go into the, onto the slope? Check the train. Okay, so we want to make sure it's safe. Check the weather. It's not happening. Uh, no, for Escape yeah, so the escape room, and then mm -hmm. if we've got enough people... Have a spotter. Yeah. Sorry? Have a spotter? Yeah, have a spotter. so if we, can, if we can afford to have a spotter there. Well, we find all the people in the pod. Yeah. Okay. So you've witnessed this, you're going to conduct a rescue, but what are you going to be doing okay. before you do it? Call the uh, tower to keep more people, people from coming. If you're at just the hill, if you're in the back country, yeah. then, then keep an eye out for other people. <coughs> Sorry? Would you look for landmarks? As far as? <coughs> well, just on the terrain, right? Whether you said, if you're looking to spot people. Yeah. For landmarks, like groups of trees, or okay, so something maybe, that you can use in relation to. Okay. Yeah. Maybe some places where they might have got calls as, as well. Don't put everybody in the search in case there's another avalanche. Okay. So there's a lot of organization here. It may be that actually someone you know, uh, becomes the leader of the, yeah. of the group as well, yeah. so they're actually directing things rather than it being a, uh, a democratic decision making. It's probably going to be more more autocratic there. Okay, so there's a few other things. We have the lights on, sir. So. Um, that little card I gave you this morning. Um, this the idea of this is it comes out in your pack, top of your pack, um, so you can bring that along tomorrow. And it's a kind of little crit card that uh, if something happens, then you know one person can maybe just go through this. And you're probably thinking, well, I'm not going to be able to get a card out and do that. Actually, if you've got a big enough group, it's a really good little aid. This because the person there can just go through and just make sure they have kind of checked in with with some of these. And uh, so, it's like some of the things we talked about, getting a leader, assessing safety, calling for help. Um, I like this. The only thing I don't like about this is I don't like the numbering system in here because you know, we've got to get away from the fact that we don't go from one to two to three because I don't agree with number two necessarily being called for help because it depends. If we've got a big group and we've got enough people to leave one person behind, then fine. But uh, I've actually heard a story where one person was caught, one was the witness. They actually got on the phone to call for help. It took them 10 or 15 minutes to get through, to 
really, really yeah. old. And the, and the friend died down here. Yeah. So that's not that's not relevant then. I would go down, dig them out, like even just to ex you know expose the the head so they got an airway, call for help, and then dig them out. And so kind of yeah, I'd like to see those numbers disappear from that. But it's it's a good card, and uh, I think at some point sort of kind of checking in uh, with each of those is a good idea. And the rest of the card's got some stuff on it, you know, um, some search patterns which we'll talk about in a moment. So, just going through, kind of like first aid, they teach you to be calm and collected. I'm not going to talk too much about these unless there's something in here. Uh, this might be in the case of the whole group's call, where it says no two is missing. Um, so then trying to figure out, well, how many, how many people are actually buried. This is uh, what I'm putting up on the, the slide here, folks, a bit more order than on the card there. But. And again, this is going to be part of the organization. Now, maybe you don't need everyone to be, you know, have beacons out, because you're actually going to need some people to be the probers and the shovelers uh, as well. And then we'll go into this tomorrow, but. The beacon, there's two settings, there's a, um, a transmit and a receive or a send and a search mode. And so if we're going on to do a rescue, we need to make sure everyone's listening. They're on, uh, on receive mode, um, otherwise it's going to confuse the search. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go into that tomorrow. And then we talked about calling for help then. And then, uh, then we start getting onto the slope. So we've done all that. Then we go down, we mark the point the person was uh, was last seen. So we've got a reference point. So, kind of like Brendan was talking about, we're kind of scanning, you know, we're looking for where they might be buried, but if you're doing all this and then you can see someone's hand way down there waving, then you don't have to go through all this process. We're going to mark it here, then we're going to search, like, go down. Them out, that's the end of the rescue. Even if they're two hundred meters down, it's <laughs> <laughs> um, And then this is it's kind of a subtle one. It's actually really important. It's uh, the recovery and marking gear. So, say, like, not picking on snowboarders, but for what we were talking about earlier, if I can see a snowball sticking halfway out of the slope. I send someone straight down because there's a good chance someone's still attached to us. And again, just go down there and lift it. It might be a ski. It can even be someone that didn't listen to me and they left their, their hand on the, uh, the ski pole strap. So it's literally going down, pulling gear up, and then pulling it back where it was. And again, just a kind of sobering story about this. A couple of um, folks skiing out of a ski area, um, caught in a slide, no beacons sort of thing. Um, one guy buried, fully buried, the other one was on the surface. He, this guy went out because he couldn't do a, a search, didn't have anything to do it with. Went out to uh, get help, ski patrol came back, and just walked onto the thing, there was a glove left, pulled the glove up, it was the guy's hand there. So if his buddy had done that, he could have probably saved him, but he was actually dead by the time he came back. So, particularly if you're dealing with people without beacons, then this is spiteful, you know, all this stuff and pulling stuff up. And even even with beacons, you know, if you can see a snowboard down there, I'd send someone straight down. Cause, you know, it could be like when you, when you say take the straps off your poles, do you mean don't throw the poles and let go at the last minute? Or because I mean, if you can get that thing up, no, I'd get rid of it probably. Get rid of it, yeah, because it's like what I'm going to have to do this So my yeah, poles yeah. in my hand, I'd yeah. rather I'd rather be able to swim than have something to poke to the surface. <laughs> you'd, they'd probably get. Pull that like around sure well. yeah. 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 No, it's no. Yeah, the pull search is going to go below yeah. the way I see. <laughs> and then, you know, again, if, if there's really sort of uh, important clues on the surface, then we just throw our skis and packs down. That's really going to confuse um, the search. So trying to keep stuff with you. And then while all this is going on, your beacon's on receive. It's on search mode. So you're doing all this. And kind of listening and looking at the beacon. And again, we'll, we'll be doing that tomorrow. So the stages would be it happens, um, you get organised, you start the search, so you're going on to the debris, 
and doing your visual and fantasy research. Let's say, let's say it wasn't anyone in your group, you saw something happen, um, you kind of did all this, you went through the whole dev research, you did fantasy research, the whole thing, no signal, what are you going to assume? Trying to see if it was an either did have one, it was on the wrong mode. Uh, yeah, either one's like it's not it's not working, so we're not going to find the beacon. Um, so they either didn't have one or it's yeah. malfunctioning or whatever. Probably more likely they didn't have one. And so how are we going to how are we going to carry on? Probe. Probe. Yeah, we're going to have to do do a probe. And often, you know, we might line up in a in a line probe. Each person does three probes. What I do before that is a um, thing called a swap probe. So maybe there's a few bits of gear. I'm kind of thinking, okay, well they came down here, and there's a rock there, and there's a tree just here. Maybe they got caught on the rock or the tree, or there's a little depression like a terrain trap. I'm going to go and probe in there. So it's literally a real fast probe around, spot probing, certain areas, you know, like the burial areas. And then after that, if I still haven't found them, then we go into a line probe. And these are slow; they're not accurate. Um, and, and you can tell when you hit them that you you know. <laughs> Especially when it pops up. I will be. We'll talk about that tomorrow, but no, it could be doubt about it. Okay. If you've got doubt, then you probably have to dig. Um, but it's, it's time consuming. You know, like <coughs> when people, if you like, you know, people are line probing, it's more of a, a body recovery than, a, than getting someone out of the If you're line probing and you think you've hit someone, um. could one or two people dig and yeah. the rest of the line carry on going? Yeah, and that's how, that's how rescue teams are there. You know, have a line probing, there'll be a group behind with extra probes. If someone thinks they've got something, they'll just keep them probe, the line keeps going and they dig. Yeah. But that's kind of an organized rescue. So if there's three of you doing it, so yeah. well, we're just going to dig, we're going to carry on. Mm -hmm. One dig, two keeps probing, you know. <laughs> you, yeah. you just can't stop. No, but I, I guess what I'm saying here is like this should never be, this should never be anyone in your groups. Because you should all have beacons, you know, if you're going into that terrain and know how to use them and things. But, you know, like I've only had to do this once ever, involved in a line probe search. Actually, the word that the frame on it was kind of miscounted people. <laughs> it's frustrating, you're like doing this and you're like, no. How long are the batteries in a, in a transceiver? Like, are they rechargeable? Or? No, don't use no. rechargeables. Uh, you want to use alkaline batteries. And they'll, you know, if you're not doing much, with them, apart from just wearing it, yeah. they're not doing much searching. They'll usually last half a season or a season. Okay. You know, it's just weekends going on. What's wrong with the rechargeables? Uh, uh, temperatures. Well, yeah, that. They also have this. They'll go. The charge will be like that, and they'll they'll drop off. Whereas alkaline, they'll actually yeah. go down like so. Mm -hmm. okay. get thrown if someone puts a beacon, say, in the, in the aisle there. Standing here, the beacon's going to go this way, so what's going on? It's because what happens, they'll just walk back in a curving line just there. So that's how the flux lines work. Also, don't, don't be thrown by the distance. So maybe it's five meters away, but it's measuring eight meters because it's measuring a curving line, not a straight line to it. The reason I sort of mention that is you know, as you come around into here, suddenly you'll, as you get close to it, there'll be a whole different bunch of flux lines here. And if suddenly you've been walking around to the left and suddenly it's telling you to go to the right, it's probably because you're very close to the beacon. And we'll give you we'll tell, give you some tactics for that tomorrow. So if that starts happening, you probably your distance is going to be like two or three meters. So we'll, uh, we'll give you some tactics for that. So that's kind of the that's the sort of induction or flux line search we are working with. So how it looks just like this really. As we move in, if it's got digital readout, then the you know the distance is getting less into there. Is that just for analog or is that for both? Uh, analog and digital? More digital actually, as far as the distance readout. Okay. Some analog beacons don't have that, the M M2 does. For the folks out there, I'm going to talk what have you got? Digital tracker two. So tracker two. I don't remember what kind of it is. What does it look like, Hello? It's red and it's a sort of box. It's kind of like it's, uh, is this. No. Maybe it's a mammoth. Yeah, mammoth, that's what it is. Yeah, just a 
the bar moves. Yeah. Okay, good digits. Yeah. What are good beacons? Sorry? What are good beacons? <laughs> uh, I must admit, like, if, if people are going to go and buy a beacon now, they'll get digital, just because they're uh, that much easier. Yeah. Um, I really like the tracker. I didn't used to, but actually, I really like it now. And the tracker 2 is really good. Uh, the, uh, the peeps is really good. And the uh, amount of pulse is, is a good one. So those three, probably. What type of pressures are they? I have not even a clue. Probably from 280 or 300 to 500 plus for the pulse. Mm -hmm. Tracker, I think the tracker actually comes in at the best price. How much is the track? Two, three fifty. It's a good one the other track. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I don't, I don't think one beacon is necessarily better than the other. It's more it's in the hands of the user. So if you don't go out and practice with it and really know how the beacon works, then, uh, then it's, you know, it's, it's not going to be that, that effective. So, so what, per, like, what percentage of people do you think they figure right now in the back country actually have one? Beacons? Yeah. I think high percentage do. But they're just getting... Yeah. It's really good, actually. Yeah. So you're assuming that maybe they do when you're going in or something like that? Yeah. I'd always, I'd always do the first search yeah. and they do, and then after that. Okay. Yeah. Just, that's, yeah, that's your best, best chance of getting them out. So they're, they're, they're getting the message now, eh? Yeah, I think um, there's definitely, yeah, I think tour, any tourers are really good for it. Ice climb is less so because that's yeah. it's kind of a different terrain. Sledders are getting there as well, but there's, there's yeah. still work, uh, yeah. work with that. Yeah. And so, analog search pattern would be kind of, it's a, it's a curving line, but it's, it's like a straight line and then turns, and then the digital would be or just kind of walking in, something like that. And then putting it all together, so kind of recognize this is where we start following the induction line into a pinpoint system. But before we do that, you know, if, we, if we're starting at the top of this slide path or the debris area and we can't hear anything, then if there's one person, you go backwards and forwards like this. Um, or maybe if you've got skis on, you might be just traversing back, backwards and forwards, or you pick up a signal. So that's one person searching. So you're making sure that you don't make these gaps too big, otherwise you could miss someone. And you're just going down, waiting to pick up a, uh, a signal. So this is primary, secondary, and then sort of pinpoint or final search. You're saying that those are 20 meters? Yeah. You'll notice on that card, I think it says 40 meters. Um, and this unfortunately goes backwards and forwards and I'm actually teaching people 20 meters with that. Um, it doesn't sound very very much but sometimes it'll depend on the beacon you're looking for and the orientation of the beacon is buried in and the way your beacon is as well. So it's kind of the latest thinking is keeping it pretty small like that. But if your beacon can handle 40, you can... Well, if yours can but Perhaps the one you're looking for can't, or it's kind of buried. All right. if, the, if the aerials aren't aligned, then the, the range is going to be different. And if it's, if it's a different beacon, and maybe you've got digital and they've got an owl, the distance could only be 20 meters. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're better off erring on the side of the conservative cool. with it. And, uh, mm -hmm. So, Three phases, kind of going down, doing a primary search. This is one person. They pick up the pick up signal or the beacon. So moving into secondary flux line search, and then down to a pinpoint. So this would be assuming starting at the top. If you're starting at the bottom, you just kind of do the thing in reverse. Uh, two people just coming down, like so. Again, you know, if you had this big debris area and you have four people, you just kind of do the same thing, right? It's a almost like a sweet surf. How far apart are they going? 20 meters. Yeah. Can they be 40 meters because you've each got a 20 meter on either side? Or? Uh, the, again, the card 
right. says that, but no. okay. just in the last year or so, people have been... So you're basically closer. working on a 10 meters either side of you. Yeah. That's your safe range. Yeah. Okay. So, just a primary search. This person is going into a secondary to do a pinpoint. So, if I was going down here, if I was on the left, when I started picking up a signal, I'd be like, right, I've got it. What's, what's your partner going to be doing? Good. Yeah. So they're going to be getting ready to probe and, and shovel. So they're going to follow, follow me down. But uh, so I'm going to be going down and get some pinpoint search. Again, we're running through this, so I'm looking for you know a pretty small box just to get. The signal I've got there. I don't want any pause between the next stage, which is probing. So again, the practice tomorrow. You can sort of think about it. It's when you get down there, maybe shouting for a probe and shovel. Or if you're working in a team and you look around and someone's down doing the, the, the fine search, if you've got probe and shovel, get there. Because you, want, you don't want any gap in that time. Because if they've, if they've worked hard to you know, get there quick, then we need to get on with the, with the rest of the... Uh, the rest. Should, should you mark the first place you, you hear a signal or get a signal? Or? Um, no, no. no. Not, if we're just looking for one person, just go, go with that. You'll be able, if you needed to go back there, you could, you could find it easy enough. You just have the on. So, the most finished folks have been a great crowd. What was that? Um, so, again, we'll cover this tomorrow, but um, as far as probing goes, um, Used to be we didn't really spend that much time talking about this, and uh, often you'd see people probing. This would be like the area they're probing. So the probe would be going in. Now, if you're looking for a, a gerbil or a hamster in the snowpack, you might need to do a search pattern this big. But you're going to be looking for someone lying in a prone position, more than likely. So you're going to be stretched out like this, pack on skis or a wall or snowshoes. And so you know the pattern that we're talking to people now is a, uh, a spiraling pattern, kind of going out from there. So that's the first probe. The next one goes in about 20, 25 centimeters away. And for me, you know, 20 centimeters is a span from there to there, so it could actually be a bit, a bit bigger. And then I'm gonna go 25 from this one, from this one, to there, to there, to there, to there, to there. And then I'm gonna, gonna go out from that one. So it's just an expanding spiral. And I you cover ground really fast with this. And if I miss the person on this one, then I'm probably going to get them on this one to, to go around and again. Uh, so I like this one. This is the one I, I teach. Uh, it's systematic and it's, uh, it's, it makes it efficient as well. Is this the same one, Craig? I, uh, I, I uh, stand on the square. You do a box one? Do a box one. Okay. okay. <laughs> So uh, Craig's talk, maybe talking about one where it's a, it's a box formation. Doesn't matter either one are, are good, but it's got to be, you know, it's not done in small areas. It's systematic and you're, you're building out, out the way there. Now in the book there was a lot, you know, two diagrams. One was straight down and one was diagonal. Well, not diagonal, but at an angle going in. Perpendicular to the slope. Yeah. Yeah, so if the slope's like this, then you're probing. Yeah, but it's still, once you've done that, you're still probing in a spiral going out from that. Is it preferable to start from the top down or uh, the other way, or it doesn't matter? For doing a search? Yes. Um, it's wherever you are, really. You know, like if you're at the bottom, then search up. Yeah. It's going to be quicker if you're at the top and you can come down and do it. But if you're at the bottom, it's, you're not going to walk all the way to the top to come back down. You'll, you'll just search going up. It's probably less effort if you go slowly downhill than uphill, no? Yeah, you might be at the bottom. <laughs> 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 yeah, if you're at the bottom, you just gotta switch up. Yeah. Um, okay, so that was kind of the plan view. This is a side on on view. Um, so we got a person buried just here. So we're doing our probing and probe, probe. Just you know, whichever system you want, and then we uh, go hit them. 
take the probe out, throw it away. No, Mark, no, 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 no. leave the probe in. Leave the probe in. Yeah, leave it in. Because it, you know, I've actually seen this in practice where people take it out and they're like, oh, I'm bit, you know, I should put it back in, and then they actually spend another 10 seconds trying to find it again. The only time I might actually pull it up is I want to try and measure how deep they're buried. Mm -hmm. If you've got a, a probe with um, 10 centimeter increments, great, you don't have to put it up. Otherwise, they're generally 40 centimeter sections, so I might just go up, okay, they're a meter, and then put it back down again. So again, if you're getting some of these stuff for Christmas, the one with the, I'd, you know, I'd go for the one with the, uh, the uh, ruler scale on it. So I've done that. So, so let's say, again, keep the maths easy, they're buried a meter down. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to move, if this is on a sl uh, slope of any sort, I'm going to move downhill one and a half to two times the distance they're buried. So if this is a meter, I'm going to move two meters down and I'm going to start digging in this way. The reason for that is what we're doing is we're throwing snow back here. Because you'll know if you've know, dug in the snow, or even in the summer, if you're digging a fence post out, some a hole, by the time you get to a certain distance in there, there's more stuff falling off the shovel than you're digging out. And so, you know, you get to a point there, it's not going to work. So, what we're doing is we're starting downhill if it is, and then we're, we're shoveling and throwing snow back out. This one. And we're digging into the, the base of the probe. And that's, that's newish over the last couple of years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And just the last one with this, just so we've covered it today. Again, going back to a plan view, so I forgot my person buried here. That's the probe. It's gone downhill two times the distance. I'm digging in this way. So I'm digging in here. Then if we've got enough people, I'm going to set them up in this formation. So again, it's looking from the top. And uh, who's, so they're all digging this way towards the, the burial. Who's got the hardest job? Brian. This one. Yeah. yeah. And really, probably after two or three minutes of hard digging, they're going to be done, like exhausted. And a lot of this is going to be, it's not going to be digging, it's actually going to be chopping. So your shovel needs to be strong enough to to dig through that. And so, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to change. So they're going to move here, there, this person comes across up here, and then this one comes up to the, the front. They dig as hard as they can, and they cycle, cycle, cycle. Are small plastic shells strong enough? Uh, generally, the advice is to use metal, metal ones, although, you know, I think the Autobox ones are pretty strong, but something from Walmart or <laughs> crappy tire. No. And I think I think generally the advice is metal. Uh, this is going to be a lot of chopping. I've seen some of those really small, like plastic ones. They seem really great for it in your backpacking. But I'm just thinking when it comes to shoveling some out, I don't know how good they are. You need probably, something. Probably good for building jumps and stuff. But yeah. Um, and this this system here is called the conveyor system. So it's conveying the snow out this way, but it's also you. It's We, yeah, we're not going to get a chance to practice that tomorrow. We might, we might kind of set up that formation and just see how it's done, but in 50 centimeters of snow. It's not going to work. It's going to dig into the ground. Tell it, your shoulder dice. Yeah. <laughs> stop, stop there on the way. Really <laughs> Alright, folks, uh, just three X marks or cross marks to spot we lost for the sort of person. That rules out that search up there. So we're going to be searching in a, in a line below that. So it could be coming in like so. Okay, so that's rescue. Uh, questions? That's getting on a bit. Okay, well, uh, tomorrow. Um, we know where we're going, where we are. Oh, so we're going. What time? Uh, 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock.
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, 9 o'clock. Ideally, if you can be there a few minutes before, then we can actually get started at 9. Um, like I said, it's going to be chaotic tomorrow. Um, it's going to be, even if it's just Yankers, it's going to be 48 students plus 6 guys. Come and find me. Um, what kind of vehicle do you have? We'll either have a minivan or we'll have a big red van with Yang down there. There won't be any, too many. So just make sure you. I don't know, the guys will be asking if you're in the KR group or the Yang group, so. Um, as long as you're with the Yang guy, it's all good. Um, gear wise. I'll maybe go on to that. Um, we can put a big program shop if you need it. Um, AT or telemark skis, footballs, snowshoes, no sleds, sorry. Uh, if you've got a question about the gear, like, like I said, I wouldn't go out and rent it unless you've already booked it. Snowshoes are fine, they're actually way more efficient right now than, uh, than skis. Often it's the snowshoes are the back to the park, not for the skiers, but I'm taking skis off and things. Um, tons of warm clothing. Uh, check on the bulletin tonight, we'll give you an idea of temperature ranges. Today's forecast will be similar to tomorrow. Um, we're going to be away, the plan is to be away from vehicles for the day, so you need a pack big enough to, to get all, all that in. Um, generally, you know, something like this that would be kind of a minimum size. Um, the point of this Really, like you don't really. Unless there's specialist pockets on the outside of packs, you don't want to be hanging things like probes and shovel handles on the outside. It should all be either inside or in specialist pockets because you know, it's easy to lose, and an apple watch is going to get ripped off. So tomorrow, if you can, you know, if you've got a pack big enough for that, then great. But certainly for the futures, if you can buy something, make sure that it's going to go in. That will work. It's a squeeze. And I'm not bringing this tomorrow. I'm bringing a bigger pack, so I'm going to take more warm clothes tomorrow. Um, and then lunch and a warm drink. Um, location, if you're not sure, if you go to Cross Lake Louise, there's a new animal uh, overpass just here. And then there's a new junction, but it's kind of the same shape as before. When you're heading up towards Jasper, Pasco Lake, Numpty Joe Lodge, and then go somewhere. Just up in there. Um, good roads, hour and a half, probably an hour and 40 minutes right now from Campbell. If you want to take a note of my cell number, actually, 